Hey guys, good morning and welcome back to this Bible study, final episode in the book of Romans this morning. First off, I will make an apology for it being about three weeks late in me actually getting this conclusion video out. Uh, the Sunday I've already preached in, in church three weeks ago, such a big day, exciting day. It was probably the most powerful moving. I wish I could have recorded that and just posted that uh, conclusion. I'll go over kind of how it went in this Bible study today because I know a few of you weren't able to make it to church, so you're going to want to watch this for your conclusion to the book of Romans. And so, you know, it was just a powerful Sunday. We had an ordination service where I had some wonderful brothers come. They laid hands on me that day. Um, just so powerful. I lost my voice between the preaching and my allergies and singing. I had no voice whatsoever. It took me about two weeks to really get my voice back good. And so, and then I've just been looking for my opportunity to come out. What a beautiful Saturday morning we've got to finish Romans today. So anyway, started this Easter of 2020. Let's finish it today. Amen. Now I urge you, brethren, verse 17. Now I urge you, brethren, note those who cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which you learn and avoid them. For those who are such do not serve our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own belly. And by smooth words and flattering speech deceive the hearts of the simple. For your obedience has become known to all. Therefore I am glad on your behalf. But I want you to be wise in what is good and simple concerning evil. And the God of peace will crush Satan under your feet shortly. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Amen. I'm going to pray and let's go into this study. Uh, Father God, we thank you, God, for the strength and the power of your word. God, lift us up this day, God, and whatever day, God, that we go to your word. Uh, help me to be the expositor, God, Lord. Help me to teach. Uh, be with those that listen, God. Remove the distractions from them so that they may learn and grow as well. Lord, we give you the praise, credit, and glory always. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And amen. So think about, we, we went through verses 1 through 16 in the last time that we had this YouTube. And in those verses, we saw this incredibly diverse church made up of all different types of people, different nationalities, different ethnicities. And we saw Paul calling them out by names. And with this final in that section, admonition to go out and greet, <laughs> I got J.B. Phillips in my mind. It says, greet each other with a holy kiss, but... You know, in our culture, mm, I'm just not a kisser. You know what I'm saying? So J.B. Phillips translated it, greet each other with a holy handshake. And so that was a pretty good way to finish. And it's a good lesson because what's amazing is, Paul, this message for unity is all throughout. Unity within the church is throughout the book of Romans. And it seems to be even today what we're completely missing today. We're doing good within our own church body to get along, and then from one church to another, we're still struggling to get along. Even within a dom denomination from one church to another, we struggle to get along. And personally, I just think it's sad. That's why when people always talk about church, you know, I'm always like, I just want you to go to church. Uh, you know, Jesus said, do not forsake the assembling of yourselves with others. That's a basic precept that you should live your life by. And so for me, like, if I know you go to a church, I'm not inviting you to our church. If you're not in church, however, yeah, I'm going after you. And that should be the same all over. Uh, you should be inviting people to church. I think the statistics are like 37% of people who end up in the church, 37% are because somebody literally invited them. So more people will come to church just because you said, hey, you ought to come with me. Because you got to think, that's what we've been talking about all along. It's been your light and how you live your life and how you reflect Christ to others. You don't think about the impact that you have, but you have a massive impact. I think something like statistics are like the preacher in the pulpit is only like 3%. Like people say, that's why they chose one church over another. 3%'s got to do with the pastor. So 37% has to do with the simple fact that someone actually invited them. And so my encourage to you, if you're watching this video, 
it's time to invite people to church. I'll invite you to my church, but hey, I just want you in a church. You know what I'm saying? And I wish we could learn to holy handshake one another and accept each other as brothers and sisters in the Lord and not look down on each other from some other point of view. So as we roll into verse 17, let's focus on that. Because now here is the exception. Because I always say to people, I want you in church, a Bible teaching fundamental church that holds to the truths of God. And so I accept that that's not all churches. Because here we see Paul writing a warning to the church at Rome because he knows what's going to happen. Jesus told us the very second he's out of here, Jesus told us and warned us to beware of false prophets. Paul is always, remember how we said a few weeks ago, Paul is always affirming the truth. Well, the truth is there's always wolves just outside the door. So the truth is there's always danger right there. And we need to always be on guard. And that's why the good pastor should be protecting his flock. That's why when we talk about the rod and the staff, remember the rod was more like a baseball bat with spikes on it, and you would use to defend the flock. Doesn't mean I'm going to carry a baseball bat this Sunday, but it's an interesting thought, you know. Be an intention getter, right? So look at what Paul says. Enough silliness, right? Now I urge you, brethren, note those who cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine. And I love as we see this, to the word doctrine, didache, the teaching, the teaching. You know, again, one of the things I always like saying, you got this group of people that are in the neighborhood of like, hey, man, I don't care about doctrine, man. I just I just love Jesus, man, okay? No doctrine. Remember, we've said it over and over. A lot of people believe they believe in something, but they probably don't believe in the God of this Bible. They probably don't believe in the Jesus. And it's not just believing you know, most people, they believe in believing. And if you're sincere enough, most of us look at it and go, oh, well, they're very sincere. So as long as they're sincere, I'm sure God's going to take care of that person. <coughs> Remember, what does Christian believing mean? We've talked about this whatsoever. Mark David's talked about in the last last week. We've talked about the word lordship. When we say the ABCs of salvation, we always make sure we always make sure and say what? Admitting you're a sinner, believing Jesus died for you, and see, here's where that lordship comes in that Mark David keeps talking about in church. Commit your life to him. There's the part where you say, God, remember what my prayer was. Lord, I wasted 34. However many more you give me, they belong to you. There's so many of us, we call ourselves Christian, but you know, we have no lordship in our lives. We've never committed our lives, and we've never given up any part of ourselves. We do good to give up an hour on Sunday morning. And so when we look at this call, contrary to the doctrine you learned, and avoid them, think about one of the big things we've picked up in Romans. Rewind way back to when we talked about salvation itself. I'm flipping back on the fly to Romans chapter 5. See if I can get there. Romans chapter 5, I'm going to read the very first verse. Therefore, having been justified, remember that word justified was so powerful. Having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom also we have access by faith into this grace in which we stand and rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. But, you know, that's, that's this basic precept, this basic teaching. If you hear anybody preach, what do we call it? We call it in our Bible study, Jesus plus theology. That it wasn't, the blood of Jesus wasn't enough. You're not saved by grace through faith. You need grace, faith, plus, you have to be baptized in our church by one of our elders, plus, you have to have the Bible that only we recommend and say you can have. Plus, you have to have the Book of Mormon as well. Plus, you have to subscribe to our magazine. 
Plus, you, you get the idea, right? I think I'm kind of beating a dead horse here with this one. But we see so much of this Jesus plus theology. Jesus plus, you have to be in our church on Sunday morning, Sunday night, and Wednesday night, and any other time, because if it's not, then I definitely know you're not really devoted, and you're really not saved after all. Jesus plus, you have to listen to this pastor. Jesus, Paul has laid out doctrine, everything that we need, and it's so important because you need to know what you believe in. So what do we do with these that that sow a false doctrine? Do I go and do I challenge them? You'll find videos on YouTube of like Christians who go and they're constantly like, here, watch me. There's a Mormon over there. I'm going to go jump this guy. Hey, man, you think? No, no. <laughs> Look at what Paul says. I urge you, brethren, note those who cause division. I, I like King James better. I think it says mark those who cause division. So in other words, you identify those who cause the division and the offenses contrary to the doctrine which you have learned. And what does he say to do? <clears throat> you don't go out and confront them. You don't go out and challenge them. You don't go out and start brawls with them and create YouTube videos of where you're jumping them. You mark them and you avoid them. It's that simple. You identify those who would seek to destroy the church. And you know, and that's one of the reasons why I like some people say, hey, pastor, you shouldn't name names in the pulpit. Yeah, I'm sorry I name names sometimes in the pulpit. I name names in particular if I know someone is full of baloney and they're drawing people away from the Lord. I don't mind sitting there and identifying those because that's part of what we're supposed to do. We identify. Uh, I'm sorry, Mr. Olstein. <laughs> you deny Jesus his place in people's lives. And by just being good enough, you're good enough for heaven. That's an abomination. So we're going to mark you, and I'm going to say, if you're listening to this and you're 12 minutes in, then you're a strong enough Christian. You should already be able to see false baloney when you see it. So we're going to identify. We're going to mark it. We're not going to get out, and we're not going to fight it and make spectacle of it. We're going to mark it, and we're going to avoid it. Because if there's one thing I've understood already, some people thrive on, they just go into church and it's not necessarily the church, they'll do it in their jobs, they'll do it wherever, they, they, they thrive on drama. And so it's literally like they live their life based on the fact they just want to go in somewhere. And I've seen these people and they just want to stir something up. It may not even be basic doctrine, it's just literally they want to sow discord around them. And so through their speech, they know how to say one thing to one set and one thing to another set that puts the two sides at enmity with each other. And Paul says, when you see these people, you just mark them and you avoid them. For those who are such do not serve our Lord Jesus Christ. So notice this. They don't understand what servitude is. The ones who do this, they've never figured out that ABC. They've never figured out, admit, believe, commit. They don't understand this. They're not serving Jesus. They're not serving the purpose. That's why we sit here and read, but they serve what? They serve their own belly. They're out to gratify themselves. They're out to take care of numero uno. You know what I'm saying here? They're look, looking at this, and y'all, we got pastors that are like this today. This is not big news. This has been going on for an incredibly long time, and by a long time, I mean 1,900 years, you've got those who seek to minister and say things simply because they want to line their own pockets. They see the preaching of the Word as a way they can make a living. And so by having a, let's not take my word for it, let's see what Paul says. By smooth words and flattering speech, now, this is big. Deceive the hearts of the simple. They use smooth words and flattering speech. I don't know why, but I'm sitting here reading this. The thing that's popping in my head is there's this Rob Thomas song called Give Me Your Heart, Make It Real, or Else Forget About It. Smooth. That was the name of the song. 
You know, one of the things I think that's cool about being a bit of a non-conventional pastor as I am, or person in any way, is the fact that, like, you know, I don't think anybody can convict me of using smooth words and flattering language. I'm kind of, yeah, my accent on all my YouTube videos for physics and other things, my accent and how I talk is usually my number one thing that people actually reference in the videos. I know I talk a bit Southern, and I definitely don't talk smooth, and I don't talk flattering. But those are, but there are those out there. We're warned of this in Scripture. They're going to say things. They're going to say these things that are going to win over your heart and deceive you. And you're going to be th sitting here thinking, man, this guy, this woman, they're they're unreal. How what they're able to say and things of this nature. You know, I thank God that I'm not. <laughs> smooth, as it were, as we look at this. But by smooth words and flattering speech, they deceive the hearts of the simple. I underline the word simple in my Bible, and I bring that up for this reason, because that's usually who people try and attack. There are churches out there that are set up to intentionally thrive upon those who know very little about the Lord. Because they know just enough religion, they know just enough about Christianity that they're susceptible to false doctrines. And people pry upon those. People will literally come into the churches from these other little, and we don't throw the word cult out. We might throw the word cult out here. I know Ravi Zacharias was always reluctant to use the word cult. I, on the other hand, like if they seek to pull people away from Jesus to worship something else, I get a little, hmm, I, I think that C word, you know what I'm saying? But as we sit here and look at this, you got people that will literally show up to church, sit in pews, and they try and they try and blend in. And, and, and you literally attack. There's the loudest bird directly over my head. That is unreal, right? Go away! It's not listening. But there are those who will go into church and literally move into the pews beside you and they'll have like one goal in mind they'll be like hey you you think this is pretty good hey you need to come to a little bible study we have at our house on tuesday nights and you can learn the real truth about god you see cuz here's the thing have you ever heard this before we have this tendency with people in church we want to uh, dunk them in the water and we chunk them in the pews and there's no education and there's no discipleship so one of the most common things I see in church, I can remember I got saved 10 years ago. You know, I still see people that were saved the same time as I was, and they've grown zero. Now, granted, you have to have your own devotion to the Word to actually get in and, you know, grow yourself. It's not all on the teacher's fault. But we do have this terrible tendency, though, where we actually... There is no teaching. No one is teaching in the church. They're getting a pep rally every week, a little feel-good session. But you've got Christians that are, and I say this so often now because it's immature Christians. You know, we spent, we spent like four weeks talking about gray areas of the church. And a lot of this has to do with maturity and immaturity within the church itself. And so these immature Christians, they're vulnerable, they're vulnerable because who are they? Who are these people going to attack? They're going to attack the simple, the ones who don't know, the ones who aren't wise in the ways of the Lord. Through their speech, they're going to be able to take and pull these away. Now look at what he says in verse nineteen: "For your obedience, I love this because he's giving them, hey, you guys are doing great in Rome. For your obedience has become known to all." Like, I mean, how would you like Paul to say that about you, to command you on your obedience, that you, you've become known to all? Therefore, I'm glad on your behalf. But this is important, and a lot of people need this word for today. But I want you to be wise on what is good. I want you to be wise on what is good. I want you to focus on the truth. Focus on the truth. This is where you need to be. If your greatest source of learning today is off of random 
Bible and YouTube type things. Oh, good grief. I'm on YouTube. But you know what I would say back to you? This is where you need to be. You need to spend your time in the truth of the word itself. Look at what he says. I want you to be wise in what is good and simple concerning evil. People will get online today and they sit here and research Satan. They research things going on. They research evil. Instead of spending time in what is good, they think they're becoming more wise by studying evil. Y'all, we've said it. You rewind back way early in this Bible study. Garbage in, garbage out. I know you think in some way that you're like growing. And people will always be asked, hey, have you heard of this false teaching? Hey, have you heard of this false? They're always throwing stuff at me. And I'm like, I just spend my time with the truth. One of the best stories I ever had was from a friend of mine. And he told me about when he went to work at a bank. One of his first jobs at the bank was literally, he had to count like $30,000 in $100 bills. $30,000 in $100 bills. Sitting there counting them. I think it was over the course of like two days. And he had no idea why he was doing it. But just sitting here counting $100 bills. One after the other. One, two, three. $30,000 in $100 bills. And then he'd only been in the job at the bank a few weeks. And somebody tried to give him a fake $100 bill at the bank. And instantly he felt it and he knew something was wrong. So he went to, you know, the bank officer who was over him and said, I think this is a fake. And sure enough, it was a fake $100 bill. And the bank officer reminded him, do you remember why, do you now know why I had you count all that money when you first got the job? You see, they didn't try and teach people at the bank to spot fakes. The bank focused on teaching people the truth. When you understood the truth, when you had a full grasp on that, you could identify the fake so easily. And that's exactly what they did. And that's what Paul's asking you to do. You need to spend your time in the truth of the word. Y'all, get off the internet. Don't, don't be looking at junk about Satanism. and I, I don't even know the right words to use for all this because it's not something don't be watching movies about it you spend your life in the truth hey we're 22 minutes in here we, well, i gotta get to moving right and look at what he says be simple concerning evil don't study the evil and the god of peace will crush you know what's interesting the god of peace when does peace really ever happen y'all we we don't know peace the world doesn't know peace until God has crushed Satan. But look at what he says. The God of peace will crush Satan under your feet shortly. You know, this is one of those parts like when I was in church the other day. I wanted to do like a little dance down the aisle. Because if you can't get excited over this, what can you get excited about, right? You got to remember something. One day we come back with Jesus and we trod through his power, nothing of us, but we trod over Satan. We look back all the way back. This is a recant all the way back from Genesis chapter 3. And we say, see that one day Satan will be crushed under the hill. And so there's where we get to share in a victory one day with our Lord. And he's coming back. And we will finally know peace when he is crushed. And now Luke says, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you, amen and amen. And like all good preachers, Paul then continues with just a little bit more, even after that benediction. And so let's finish this up. Timothy, my fellow worker, and Lucius, Jason, and Sosipater, my countrymen, greet you. So now Paul starts going through this list of other guys that are with him, sitting here like, hey, as I write this letter to you, church at Rome, the other team, y'all, you got to remember, Paul was not a one-man show. He had a team that was around him, a team with him. You know, one of the things we're about to look at tomorrow, and who knows, maybe I'll get out tomorrow and I'll do a Timothy video tomorrow. Timothy is the first name mentioned here. And so when we look at the life of Timothy, Paul said there's no one as like-minded as Timothy when it comes to, uh, you know, their purpose. 
And so when we look at Timothy itself, uh, you know, it's interesting. It's Timothy, the book, Tim, one, first Timothy starts. One of the things Paul says to Timothy is, you know, he's making sure he stays where he's at. You know, and there's a lot of ideas like we'll see tomorrow. Like, why did Timothy want to leave the church at Ephesus? And, you know, one of the things I think I'll be quick to say is like we see at this point, Timothy is with Paul. And so this is before Paul's ever been in prison in Rome or anything. Timothy's with him. And you got to think, Timothy may have just wanted to come back, Paul being who Paul was, and he just wanted to continue to serve directly under and in the presence of Paul. But Lucius and Jason and Sosipit are my countrymen, so it appears there are probably other Jews as well, Jewish people, Jewish converts through Paul. And I love this part. I, Tertius, who wrote this epistle, I, Tertius, who wrote this epistle, and all the word Tertius actually refers to is like he is the third child probably, at least potentially, wrote this epistle, greet you in the Lord. Wait a minute, I thought Paul wrote this. For some reason, this is called confusion. I don't understand why. Uh, it's not that uncommon for, especially you think of executives or things like that, to dictate letters and that's who Tertius was and I like how Tertius managed to get himself into the book of Romans and I Tertius who wrote this epistle greet you in the Lord and now back to 23 so Tertius was just he was just taking the notes he was writing it down as Paul was pouring this out Gaius my host and the host of the whole church or Gaius my host and the host of the whole church greet you. And so here we see this guy Gaius, who is obviously a patron of Paul as well, who was probably allowing Paul not just to stay in his house, but we also see he was the host of the church. And again, I say this because we have this tendency to think of like when church is used, the church that we think of now with these dedicated buildings, and it really wasn't. It was always in homes at this time. They always met in homes, and so we see Gaius as one of these persons that did this. And, you know, and my hat's off to these people because the people that, you know, host these home Bible studies and things like that, it's a, it's a tremendous amount of work because you're letting all these people into your house, and your house is going to get dirty. Your house is going to have to be clean before they get there. It's going to have to get cleaned after they leave. And you, so, you know, it's a pretty good commitment to the Lord when you see people that do this. Erastus, the treasurer of the city, greets you. Quartus, a brother, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. And you know, and it's not as important about who these people were at this part, but it's just the fact that, you know, it's even in church right now. I still need someone to take over the sign at the church. It said the same thing for like two months now. Because it's one of those things, y'all, there's enough work Y'all, if the church grows, if Mountain View grows, it's not because of me. It's going to be because of the team, the people, you and me working together that we help grow it and build it because there's enough work for everybody to go around. So I implore you, somewhere in this commitment to the Lord, there should be a service in response to it. And it doesn't necessarily mean teaching. For some reason, people think, oh, you've got the highest calling. You're the one preaching. The highest calling is whatever God has called you to do. And I'll say it again. And if you feel God calling you to help out with the sign, come on and talk to the pastor. I'll happily let you start to work on that. But the thing is, it's something needed. And Paul's showing it right here. Paul was not a lone warrior in this. And if nothing else, I'll say this. Make sure you're praying as pastor and preacher. You need those praying for you. You need those prayers. Now for the final few verses. Now to him who is able to establish you. It's not the first time we've seen the Greek word used for establish here. Literally means we've seen it before. He who is able to establish you literally means who stands you up. You think you are because of you? I am who he says that I am. You know what I'm saying? God is the one that established me. God is the one that stands me up. 
God is the one that holds me up. I love that song. I thought number one would always be me. I thought I could be what I wanted to be. I thought of myself as a mighty big man. But what? I can't even walk without you holding my hand. You know, that's this basic thing we've got to understand. Him, capital H, who is able to establish you. And now I love this. I, I just want to scream right now. According to my gospel. Paul, why do you mean according to my gospel? This is the gospel. Paul is so... This message, this word means so much to Paul that he calls it my gospel. He lays a claim. He's my Lord. He's my Savior. This is my Jesus. I love that. If you're driving down the road right now, just say, my Jesus. If you're at a red light, roll down the window, look over somebody and go, hey, my Jesus can do anything this morning. If we isn't, man, I should have done this at church. My Jesus, my gospel, and the preaching of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery kept since the world began, but now made manifest by the prophetic scriptures, made known to all nations according to the commandment of the everlasting God for obedience to the faith. To God alone, wise be glory through Jesus Christ forever. Amen. So what's the revelation of this mystery that's been revealed? The mystery that's been revealed has always been if you remember, we've said it over and over. Salvation was never just about the Jew. So the mystery was, how was God ever going to bring all of us home? And so the mystery revealed is through the blood of Jesus Christ. <laughs> I just said it, to bring us home. The blood of Jesus Christ. I had a friend over at the house, another pastor this week, and he was making reference as to... Uh, um, random questions. For some reason, the second you become a pastor or a preacher, everybody thinks you know the most random Bible knowledge. And we were discussing that. And now this wasn't the case of that, but this was a question he said he got asked in other church ones. Uh, why did Jesus go to the cross was the question. And so, you know, we could give a lot of deep theological answers to that. Why did Jesus go to the cross? We're sitting at my table eating banana pudding, my six-year-old's over there beside me. And while we're sitting there talking, he goes, why did Jesus go to the cross? My six-year-old goes to bring us home. Doesn't even stop eating the pudding. He's like watching TV. I don't even think he's in the conversation. And I have to turn around and say, I, say what? And he goes, and we go, why did Jesus go to the cross? And he says, to bring us home. It's no more perfect than that. The mystery from the foundation of the earth was always how did God have in mind to unite Gentiles like us with him? And it happened through a cross. And the mystery's been revealed. And one day, because of the work that he did, I can go home one day because I give my life to him. And through his blood, I'm saved. I'm going to read that last line one more time. To God alone wise be glory through Jesus Christ forever. Amen. And we finally see the greatness and the glory of God's redemptive plan. If you think about it, think about everything we've learned through the book of Romans. This plan was so big with so many moving pieces it's impossible for a little finite light mind like ours to understand. And the thing is, you've got to understand today, the plan's not over yet. It's still got to finish. When we see the world in the shape it's in today, if you've done anything to study in this book, you know that everything that's going on is exactly what Scripture said would happen. And at this point, the only hope you'll ever have is the hope that is in Jesus Christ who lives forever. Amen. Let's pray.
Father God, we thank you, God, for that hope, that certainty, God, that you save, God, that through your blood, through your name, and our commitment to you, God, we can go home to be with you one day. God, we thank you for this book. We thank you for your plan of salvation. We thank you for thinking of us before the foundation of the earth. God, we love you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, if you stuck this out, if you've watched every YouTube message, holler at your boy. You've earned a reward. I don't know what that is yet, but you get back to me. Hey, guys, I love all of you. Pick back up as we start First Timothy tomorrow. Hope to see you in church. Hope to see you online. Hey, guys, love all of you. Bye.